meet up. We are recording. You're good to go. Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Digital Rebar and the Rackin team. We are here today for version 12 of the Digital Rebar Meetup. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about the 3.7 releases, plural. Uh, since we last met, we've released 3.7.0 and 3.7.1. We'll talk a little bit about the goodness that's in those. Uh, we'll do a quick UX uh, mini demo on you, the new UX features for pretty print colorization of JSON and the dip code that our esteemed Greg Althouse put into the UX for us. Uh, we'll also do a boot M install demo, uh, a quick mini demo of the two uh, main paths for installing boot M ISO images. Uh, today we're gonna skip over the Terraform plugin demo and we'll resurrect that at the next meetup or a future meetup. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, well, last last time, last time on Digital Rebar Meetup, always got to do the last time, right? So last time we talked about some of the major DHCP changes and refactor that uh, Victor Lowther and Greg Althaus both worked on. Uh, I believe Victor did a lot of the DHCP stuff there, and also he did a huge amount of work on getting UEFI uh, boot support work going. We talked about feature flags and versions. Uh, we did a, a major bug scrub and we did some next boot magic discussions uh, also around uh, being able to make digital rebar much more easier to use and operate. Uh, today we'll go ahead and kick off, uh, what do we kick off with? How about the UX uh, mini demo? Uh, so for the UX uh, mini demo, we have, uh, oops, let's go to the right page, we have our uh, to set for the expectations on the demo, we're just gonna show uh, the colorization and the pretty print capabilities and content so that it makes it easier to understand what you're installing, what you're looking at, and if you wanna upgrade content, what the differences are between those content pieces. So for an example, uh, if we wanna just jump over to our content packages in the UX, we'll see that we've got some content Shane, you're muted now. I don't think he knows we can't hear him. I put on the chat. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Sorry, my uh, phone decided to co-opt my Bluetooth to my computer. Uh, where did you guys lose me? Pretty much as soon as you started talking. <laughs> All right. No, no, Let me, uh, talking about this, yeah, about this page here. Okay, so let's, resetting since uh, we had a Bluetooth fail there. Uh, so the goal is to take a look at um, the different content that we have in the platform to be able to, to view the JSON and also to view the differences between a couple of different versions if you wanna see what has changed or what is going to change in the content. So an example, if you go to your content uh, packages on the left menu selection, we see that in this uh, DRP endpoint I'm running in my virtual box, we've got some content installed in the center console, uh, content panel. And an example of the DRP community content, we've all probably seen this if we use the UX contents packages before, it breaks down the different boot ends, params, profiles, stages, tasks, templates, etc. We can expand those out and we can bore in on a specific instance. So for today, let's pick on Debian 9 install. And then we see the, the JSON stanzas that make up the content for this. Now, this doesn't show us a whole lot here in pretty print view, but we have this new show raw JSON slider, which if we click on, uh, it'll give us a new panel. Uh, that's going to show us the entire JSON blob with some colorization or pretty print uh, stuff as well as some enhanced uh, capabilities for viewing it. Uh, as you all probably noticed there, it took about a second or two to load up. Uh, the the lo lo JSON, or excuse me, the um, JavaScript library we're using in the background when it goes through and does all the pretty print, draws and renders all of this, takes a moment or two. Uh, it's particularly noticeable on the larger 
content pieces like the DRP community content, which is fairly large. But it has some really nice features. For example, it gives us the content broken down in a colorization and it shows us, for example, if we look at the sections, boot M's, CentOS 7 install and available, it shows us it's a, a Boolean type and it's currently uh, value is false. And you'll see that there's the expand and uh, uh, can, uh, collapse capability for each of the sections. So if you didn't want to look at a specific section of content, you can just expand it or collapse it and it'll allow you to minimize sections of content. Uh, we also have a, a clipboard, which allows you to uh, copy and paste the content. So if I select the clipboard, and you'll see a little uh, feedback with a check mark pops up that it's copied that stanza to my clipboard. And indeed, if we go to an editor here and we paste, it's copied that specific stanza uh, for me to use somewhere else. Very nice feature uh, if you're messing around with a JSON. For example, you might want to be authoring content, go to uh, an existing content example and copy a, a stanza of JSON as a reference copy while you're editing, modifying content. It's a really nice feature to help uh, with editing capabilities of the content. Um, and like I mentioned, remember it can take a few seconds for the larger content blobs to load. If we look at the uh, smaller content uh, stuff, they don't take quite as long to load. You click on, for example, the crib stuff, it loads pretty much right away. So that's nice to do, to, to see. In addition to that, uh, we have a diff capability. So if you want to take a look at, uh, in this example, we have crib content version 1.60 installed, and we see that through the version inspector, we have version 161 available, and I want to know what the difference is. So I can select the version 161 selector, click on diff, and we get a uh, pr abbreviated difference of what has changed in this content. And if we actually see that 160 and 161, there's a fair bit of changes that occurred here. Um, this is a, a little bit of refactoring that uh, has happened in the background to clean up and make things better. Uh, but we can see that these are the specific differences within the full uh, blob of JSON. If you wanted to see the entire blob of JSON so you could see these differences in context, you click on the show full, now we get the whole entire JSON blob with all of the various sections uh, and pieces that didn't change along with the differences that have changed within a JSON. So it's very nice when you're not familiar uh, with the specific changes and what they might uh, uh, modify in your existing system or use of that content to be able to take a quick look at what's going to happen if I upgrade to this version. And since I'm all super duper excited about the changes uh, in crib, I'm gonna go ahead and say upgrade, and boom, now I'm running the latest crib update. So that's sort of a brief rundown on UX demo changes. Greg, are there any other changes in the UX you wanted to point out? We had a lot of changes between the different releases. Um, I was gonna cut over next to specifically our 3.7.0 and 3.7.1 uh, releases. Uh, notes, but I didn't know if there's anything at this point you wanted to, to demo or highlight, I should say, um, to put you on the spot. I think so. Um, there's a lot of cleanup and bug fixes. I posted the version. Yeah, we were, was going to go through the releases uh, info. You can do that at some point. But yeah, that's the. Yeah. That's the major coolness. <laughs> All right, so we'll uh, go ahead and cut over next to uh, releases. And uh, like I mentioned previously, 3.7.0 and 3.7.1 came out since our last uh, round of meetup. Uh, we had a long lead up to this release cycle. We typically release a little faster than that, but we had some pretty significant and interesting changes in there. Um, starting in 3.7.0, Greg, you want to talk about features or uh, in 3.7.0, um, we don't need to go too deep dive, uh, just touch on the major pieces uh, since we've covered sort of all of this in the last two meetups uh, as these developed. 
Yeah, so just generally we did some DHCP updates, increased UFI support, brought back better proxy support, and then um, the kind of new one we hadn't talked about very much is we've added hardware adders to the system so that when the machine gets added the first time through Sledgehammer, we record all the MAC addresses of the system so that we can handle um, boots bouncing around between different MAC addresses. Um, so that's kind of the DHCP set of changes um, for 3.7. Then whole plugin version two stuff, which we kind of talked about already. Um, increased logging in DHCP so you can actually see the, the packet flows going on in more detail. And the neat thing about that format is it allows, them to, allows us to add that into the unit test um, if there's a weird case showing up. Um, let's see. Uh, a lot of bugs. Yeah, a lot of bugs. Um, the Docker, oh, one thing is Docker containers are now actually being built for the version pieces. Um, that started in 3.7, so tip and stable were accurate. Um, in 3.7.1, uh, even the version one will now be accurate too. Um, That's nice, because that makes a good deployable, production deployable solution easy for, in the field for operators. Yeah. For running containers. The big thing with that is you can only run it in a place that lets you do network containers. Um, on the host network side. So you can't do it on a Mac. Right. Macs are broken. We all know that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and then a lot of doc updates. And the big one from a UX usability perspective is the default UX now points to stable or portal. Ah, uh, yes. So that was what I was using earlier is portal.rackend.io is the new production UX endpoint. Uh, which is an important change for people to, right. to remember because that's where we'll keep the stable UX code. That's right. Um, let's see. Yeah, Go High, we um, to address some of the issues people were finding with Go High, we embedded that into DRPC CLI so that it can be updated in Sledgehammer. And we can add and enhance it as we go. Let's see, I guess that's kind of it. The rest are kind of some small knit things uh, with regard to debugability and some control stuff. Um, major bug fixes of note. Um, mostly in 3.7.0. Oh, there's quite a few deadlocks in 3.6. We think we've got most of those taken care of. Yes. Big set of uh, bug fixes around that so um yeah the other thing is we victor really fixed the address cache was having some issues on various platforms and the um, static ip shouldn't be required anymore across the board especially once you move to 371 it should be a very special case now to add the static ip Okay, excellent. And then in 3.7.1, uh, which came out right quickly after 3.7.0, though we fixed up a lot of uh, Mac OS X stuff. So Mac OS X isn't as much as a red-headed stepchild. Am I allowed to say that red-headed stepchild? Bastard child? No, I can't say that I either. I doubt it. So. <laughs> okay, I won't say any of that. It, it gets better support for Mac OS X. Uh, in this case, uh, install that shell gets some uh, uh, enhancements around it uh, around the static IP static IP isn't required anymore which is very nice because of I believe that was from Victor's address cache fixes is that correct yeah so that enabled the steps and then we found one more issue specific to max that required us to make a change inside of the UDP handling with that in place and the address cache fixes you don't need static IP anymore Nice. And then, the, That's good. go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, and so then we also, uh, to help 
those people installing it on a Mac the first time, aggregated some of the additional install support brew commands you need so you get them all at once instead of having to rerun it over and over and over to find out what you missed. And we also updated the remove command on the install.sh. So remove will function now properly for production. And um, we updated docs to tell you that if you're going to run isolated, put it in a directory so that you can remove that directory and just be clean. Um, remove also picked up a um, dash dash remove data flag so that you can actually remove both the binaries and the data from your production system if you want to just totally blow it away. So um, let's see. Then we also um, updated the DHCP server a little bit more. We found that most people were using, a lot of people were using VirtualBox on Mac, seeing as we show it as an example all the time. And we're getting tripped up by the fact that the iPixie inside of VirtualBox is just really bad. And so um, Victor went and added uh, iPixie option processing so that we can figure out if an iPixie doesn't have enough support for things. And if it doesn't, we fall back to the appropriate non-Pixie chain loaded thing. So in this case for VirtualBox, it'll switch back to LPixie Linux. And that way you don't have to do the specialized, let me go and update the boot file for my VirtualBox environment. All of that should just work now. Nice, very nice. Because that was causing a lot of grief with a lot of people. And I think that this is, gets reflected now in the subnets stuff. So and you'll see I have carried over option 67 in the subnets. That's actually no longer necessary in a virtual box environment. We'll automatically figure out how to serve the correct uh, Pixie pieces okay. for broken virtual box iPixie implementations. So I should be able to remove this from my configuration and it's not necessary anymore. Also, you'll see that my next server, which I did update, uh, next server is empty. And because of a lot of the address cache stuff, we serve the next server IP address dynamically based on where the client uh, machine connection came in so that the next server is set automatically. So this doesn't have to be set in a subnet also. So it helps make ease of use and setting your and defining your initial subnet uh, specification a lot easier for um, people that aren't familiar with all of the pixie options that are necessary for implementing uh, pixie boot configuration and management uh, all of these options can be overridden though so if you have a special use case that we haven't yet or we don't have an end corner or edge corner case for it, you can modify these as per standard to override the behaviors uh, for the built-in behaviors to do the auto discovery magic coolness. Uh, anything else I missed in that litany? No, I think that's it. Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, the few other things we updated were, um, like I said, the UI got a few more fixes with regard in 101. Um, a few cleanups for some links that were dead which we get to see in our portal now reports at the top of the page, our DRP endpoint and our UX version. So we'll see that 101 is the stable version of the portal now. That's right. And then um, the content packages picked up some changes as well. Uh, most of them were icon updates, but um, across both 160 and 161, they both moved again. Um, between the two of them, we picked up more icons and colors for the various component pieces. Um, the main content change was the introduction of the setup.temple uh, template that contains a boilerplate stuff for installing DRP CLI and putting the appropriate uh, environment variables in place so that you can run DRP CLI commands from within your tasks. And so the follow on in 161 is to convert most of the other pieces to use that new setup template piece. I forget uh, one of the templates. Do you remember off the top of your head, Greg? One of the uh, templates. So DRP. Uh, no. Uh, yeah. Hmm. They're in there somewhere. Packet discover, maybe? I don't know. 
I don't think I, I don't have packed uh, well, Some of them are in the boot environments, in the, in the uh, boot templates. And then um, they're also, oh, well, they may not be in, in, I don't know where we put them. Crib had some updates for them, so like the crib, uh, crib install.sh, I think, had it. Um, like that one could use it. Apparently, we didn't get them all. So if you go to. Here we go. Here we go. So mount discs.shell that template shows the new uh, uh, template setup.temple. So this uh, does all the DRP CLI to generate and, and get a, a token to be able to authorize the script to communicate back yeah. to the uh, DRP endpoint. So this sort of sum collapses down, you know, a dozen or so other lines of uh, co content that we were replicating between the different templates. So now we've sort of minimized it and it's a nice simple helper where we can make a, a single modification to affect a change across all of the templates that we use this. Yeah. So that, that's what we're referring to here. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so I think that's about it for the changes. So okay. Put all of the release notes in the channel. So if you look for them there. Yep. And the release notes are always available from digital rebar provision slash releases. So you can find the various release notes and then also the uh, read the docs. We have uh, the in the table of contents, you can go to the upgrade page and the upgrade page contains version to version specific notes. So as we move through the different versions, we have all the various things you need to be aware of in your upgrade path. So for example, 360 to 370 uh, was the plugin system was the biggest change. There wasn't a whole lot of change to any content, et cetera. Uh, but the upgrades version to version specific notes is where you want to fall back to for determining what you may need to be aware of in an upgrade path. Anything else around that, Greg? I think that's about it. All right, then I will cut over to the ISO upload mini demo. There's two parts to that. Uh, so this is necessary uh, as part of one of the initial setups or the setup of new boot environments. So a boot environment uh, has uh, a definition that contains usually an ISO image or a tarball in the case of Sledgehammer, that is the actual uh, piece of content that is used or manipulated for the install process. So for example, CentOS 7 um, ISO part ISO is used to do the Pixie boot of uh, CentOS 7 and then to do an initial install of the minimal uh, pieces necessary to install a CentOS 7 through package based install. Uh, to do that, uh, you have to have two parts. You have to have the content which defines the boot environment which is what we're looking at here, these boot environment definitions. And we can see the column checker X uh, column shows us if the ISO is available and to be used. So in this case, I have the CentOS 7 and the Ubuntu ISOs and the Sledgehammer uh, distribution installed, but I don't have any of the Debian 8 or Debian 9 installs. So what I'm gonna show you real briefly here is the two-step process in the UX on how we can obtain the ISO uh, from our uh, management workstation and then push it to the DRP endpoint through the UX. And then I'll show you very briefly how to do that through the CLI. It's pretty easy. It's documented in the quick start. We've occasionally had questions on this, so we thought we'd cut a, a quick video on how to do this. But for this example, we're gonna do boot, the boot environments for Debian 9 install. If we click on this, we see all of our standard error messages, the warning, 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 the world is going to end. Uh, you don't have your Debian 9. AMD 64 mini ISO image installed, so we can't actually do a Debian 9 install. But in this content uh, information, we see the ISO URL that would be used to uh, install this. So, oh, also we have our raw JSON output, which is available here, which is really nice if you wanna see the content of the boot environment configuration. So that's a very nice uh, addition that came in recently as well. 
So in this case, in the two-step part, we simply click on the mini ISO. It's going to download the ISO, prompt me to install it on my workstation. I'm going to install the mini ISO in my images directory. And it's pretty small, so it, uh, 39 megabytes, so it installs pretty quickly, downloads pretty quickly. Uh, and we'll see that remembering that the uh, error messages are here. The second part of our two-step process is we go to the boot ISOs page. And from here, we're going to upload the new ISO. Now, this is going to take the ISO from my workstation and push it to the endpoint. So we want to drag or drop or go and select the mini ISO, in this case, mini ISO. And the last piece we have to provide is which boot environment this belongs to. And so in this case, it's the Debian 9 AMD64 mini ISO. And we say upload, and boom, it's pushed it up to the DRP endpoint running locally. And so now we see in the, the boot ISOs and images, our Debian 9 uh, AMD64 mini ISO uh, is showing as installed on the system. But we want to be pedantic, go back to the boot environment, and we see that, yes, indeed, the Debian 9 install is there, which is good. Uh, and if we click on the Debian 9 install, we don't get all the horrible warning messages. And we can also see that the available, I shoot, do we show the available flag in the UX? It's a good question. I didn't verify that. Um, well, by virtue of the fact that we didn't get the error, the error. the available uh, flag is set to true in this case. Yeah, the available flag is set on the other table. Okay. Uh, and so that, that's the, basically the two step process. This is nice if you have the ISO images already on your workstation, particularly the larger ones, CentOS 7, Ubuntu, or if you have uh, Windows deployment images you're doing and you want to push these up really fast and you don't want to go back to, uh, in the Linux world, the public mirrors. The public mirrors are often very, very slow depending on which mirror you hit. And oftentimes it can take a long, long time to download an eight, seven or 800 meg uh, ISO image. So this is a real quick way to do it from the UX. Uh, if we jump over to the uh, CLI, oh, I need to wipe the ISOs first. Oh, actually we'll do it with the eight. I was gonna show. Uh, if we do uh, DRP CLI and we look for the list, we're gonna first determine the name of the boot environment because we have to reference the boot environment name correctly to do the ISO upload helper from the command line. So we're gonna run our DRP CLI boot ends list, pipe it to JSON, uh, JQ rather, and grab the name. So we see here that we've got our Debian 8 install. We're gonna do in this case. If we do our show uh, Debian 8 install, we get our JSON content, and I can make this prettier for you. And so we have a little colorization. We see the same thing reflected in the UX, uh, specifically ISO URL, in this case, shows us the source of the URL uh, for the ISO image itself. But our CLI, the RP CLI boot ends command, has a nice helper called upload ISO. An upload ISO gives us the ability to quickly install the ISO based on the boot env install or Debian 8 install. And we kick that off. And now what's happening is from our DRP endpoint, my DRP endpoint name happens to be Pixie here, uh, it goes out to the listed URL uh, in the boot env and downloads that, installs it, and does the explode. So it went out and fetched, based on the boot end, uh, the mini.iso for this specification. And in fact, if we go uh, take a look at our JSON output for the Debian 8 install, and we, start, we use JQ to grab the available string, we see available has been set to true now. And if we come back to our uh, uh, boot and ends in the UX, we refresh our list and we see our Debian 8 install is now installed. We can also go to our boot uh, ISOs list and we see the Debian 8 ISO list is installed. So those are the two kind of basic mechanisms for doing the install. We can do the same thing with a CLI from a remote machine. The RPC CLI supports the use of the endpoint flag, 
which defines a remote uh, endpoint to uh, uh, run the transaction against. So in this case, if I was on my uh, Mac OS X directly and from the shell and I had DRPCLI installed there, I could do DRPCLI with a minus cap E, HTTPS colon WAC WAC 192.168.1 colon 80.92. And it would actually push the, the commands to that remote endpoint. So this is also important for uh, endpoints that are buried uh, behind a, a management VPN. They don't have direct internet access. You may not be able to actually run the command from the DRP endpoint itself. You'd run it from a management workstation after you've enabled the VPN configuration uh, connection to that management network. That is it in a nutshell for the Meno Mini uh, demos today. Uh, just toss it out there to our community. If anyone has in the community has any questions or comments for today that you would like to talk about, address, uh, tell us about your fabulous experiences with Digital Rebar, uh, tell us about your frustrations, what you'd like to see fixed. Uh, anyone on community, do you have anything you'd like to provide feedback on? Going once. Going twice. Sold. All right, that's it for today. Uh, let's take a look at our, you know, we covered everything. We're not going to do the Terraform this round. We'll do that uh, next uh, meetup or we'll do it in the following meetups. So that's a wrap for version 12 of the Digital Rebar meetup. We will see all of you on March 13th for version 13 of the Digital Rebar Meetup. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your attendance.